Righty, hey, I'm going to jump right into it. We are continuing our series, How to Read the Bible, uh, and we've been looking at a whole bunch of different things. Last week, we specifically kind of dialed in to what it looks like to read the gospel uh, account, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we're going to pick up that conversation. If you missed last week, I encourage you to go listen to it, but a brief recap was we talked a little bit about the history of what led to the point of where Jesus was born and where those gospel narratives were recorded, uh, and we specifically kind of dialed in to the idea of that gospel being this royal announcement of Jesus coming and the the culmination of this incredible uh, story. And so we're going to kind of continue this idea because I want to help people uh, and even myself learn to read the gospel story better. Learn to read these, these four accounts of the gospel better and, and to get more out of them because it's, it's probably one of the most read uh, parts of the Bible, right? We get to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And because, and this is why, because it is the, the, the peak, the climax of the story, and it also has the best character, Jesus, like the best characters in it. So that's the story I want to read. And so I'm sure and many of you uh, have read the, the gospel according to Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, and I'm sure many of you have read all of them, uh, probably more than once. But I want to look at some tools and some ideas and have, have a little bit more understanding so we can continue to understand what these, these books mean and, and realize why they're so relevant uh, still to us today. And so here's, here's the thing about these, uh, the, the four gospel accounts that we have, uh, is this. They are, and we, we touched on this briefly last week, they are. Uh, an ancient, st- in the ancient style, like a biography, right? We're, we're familiar with biographies. Maybe you watch biography or, or read biographies or watch like a documentary biography of someone. Like we're, we're, we're um, aware of that literary style, but ancient biographies are a little uh, different um, because really what, the, different than like a specific play by play, this is someone's life and all these key uh, events, um, they, they really are trying to get the meaning or the, the idea through the life story and message, not necessarily like play by play specific events. Uh, and that's important for us to, to, to know. Uh, we talked about this last week. They're not archival or unbiased accounts. They're very open in the fact that I'm going to tell you this story about Jesus that happened. Uh, and I have a purpose for telling you the story. It's because I want you to believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he lived, died, was buried and resurrected. Like there's, there's no bias. It wasn't like it was a secret. Their, their motive was very upfront of what they're wanting to do. And that's good. We, we want to know that. Um, and they were, they were wanting to understand that the, the motive of all four of these, uh, these accounts is the desire for you to emulate the key character figure, not, not just to gain knowledge about their life, right? I can read a biography about Winston Churchill and I'll learn a lot about his life. And one of the things I'll learn is I probably don't want to emulate Winston Churchill, right? Like he was fine, he was great, but like, I don't think I want to be him, okay? But when I read the Bible, it's not like, wow, what great stats about Jesus, That's not what I'm supposed to take away from the story. I'm supposed to come away from the story knowing I want to be like Jesus. I want to live like Jesus. I want to to think and to eat and to breathe. I want to be like Jesus. That is what the result of reading these encounters of who Christ is. It should be this transformative, not just to know stats. And that's why this this whole idea, it ties into who we are as a church and and the the identity of we are as our mission statement. When I mentioned it earlier, when I say know Jesus and show Jesus, I've shared this many times, I want people to know Jesus personally because I believe that'll transform the end into his image and begin to share that with other people. I don't want to be a church that knows a lot about Jesus. And maybe you're like, what's the difference? I grew up in in a place and in a way in which I knew a lot about Jesus. To quote where one of my favorite movies, Nacho Libre, Libre, like, you may think I don't know a butt ton about the Bible, but I do. (laughs) Right? Like, I knew lots of stats and words and terms and histories, but I did not know, truly intimately know, the person of Jesus. In fact, I had allowed my book knowledge of Jesus to create a thought process that I actually didn't need Jesus because I had done it on my own. But then wouldn't you know, because of a good, his goodness and his grace and his mercy, he found me and I realized I too am a sinner in desperate need of Jesus Christ, but he has made me righteous by his goodness. And so I find this perspective. That is what these accounts are doing. 
And, and here's some things. This is a little bit of history, but also some understanding so that we can know what's going on. In this time of Jesus, remember, Jesus was born somewhere around, you know, like the, the turn of the, the millennia, right? So like, like 1, 2 AD, maybe it was a little bit BC, but like right in that area. That's why we mark our calendars in that, that place. People argue and debate when it was. I don't know. I'm not smart enough. But here's the thing. We know he grew 30 years. Then he lived for three years. And then he died. But what, what happened was it wasn't like Jesus died on the cross. He was there for 40 days. And it wasn't like, and then on the 41st day, the Bible was written. That's not how it happened. The stories were out there. The oral narratives were out there. The disciples were preaching. They were busy sharing and spreading the good news of Jesus Christ to everyone. That's, we, we get the accounts later. You read about it. It was a whirlwind. They're appointing new disciples. They're going all over the place. They're getting persecuted. People are getting killed. They're meeting Ethiopian eunuchs on the side of the road and baptizing them. Like stuff is happening. But then at some point they say, ooh, we need to write this down. We need to write these things down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit because this message is bigger than just this. Let me tell you something I saw yesterday. We need to write this down. And so there's actually a, a lot of writings from this time, a lot of writings. Good, some of them really good, uh, legitimate good writings. Uh, and then other of them, I think, kind of made up for other purpose writings. But the four gospel accounts that we have, there was a very specific criteria when people were filtering through. It's like, this is canon. And I believe this was done under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and looking at it, meeting the whole contextual of both what the Old Testament and the New Testament has. So the first thing is this. There's four things that these gospel accounts all have in common because they all, uh, they, they approach it differently, but they have four things that they have in common. The first is this, all four of them reference the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament, all four of them. And this is very important. There's a lot of writings from that time that referenced Jesus or referenced the new church, but they never referenced uh, any of the, the Jewish heritage background. And, and that's, that's important. That's not necessarily good or bad. It's just that it was important and these characteristics to understand that it referenced the Hebrew Bible. And it did this a couple of, of different ways, and, and, but we see it all the way. Mark starts off, right at the beginning with a quote, with a quote from the Old Testament. In fact, it, it's Isaiah and Malachi, even though he says it's from my, but he, he basically says, hey, this is what it says in Isaiah. It gives you this great quote. Matthew starts off with the, the genealogy of Jesus <laughs> right away. And by the way, here's, here's a little fun thing for you to think about. It's not even the full genealogy of Jesus. It's actually missing generations. It was this like 14 and 14. And it's very specific. It's very specific. There's, I'm not going to tell you, like, because I don't know, but you can look into it. There's very specific. It's not all of it. And they know you can go back and look at it in Chronicles and be like, what about that guy? Why wasn't he in there? I guess that's for you to think about. But you know what is in there? It's very interesting. Not only are these things for David and Abraham and all these, these pieces, but there's four women named in the genealogy of Jesus. And here's what's wild. For sure, two of them weren't even Jewish. Some people argue none of them were Jewish because Bathsheba was, her husband was a Hittite and we, we are not a hundred percent sure of what her back background is. And then same with Tamar. We don't, it, the Bible's not specific about where she came from, but what we do know is all of them had some fairly sketchy pasts, but all of them received redemption through the power of God. And they're named in a time when genealogies didn't have women. But Jesus is dead. Jesus is dead because the seed of woman was always important to God. Always important to God. So Matthew right away, right away goes in there. Luke gives this interest. Luke, if you've read Luke, he gives, the, he gives this preamble about how he made the book. It's very interesting. He was kind of like contracted by someone and that guy gets a, like a, uh, a shout out in the beginning of his book, but he starts off with this, like we've talked about this hyperlink, this pair, this parallel narrative. He talks about this priestly couple who they can't get pregnant, but they're barren. But then an angel comes and tells them you're going to get pregnant. And it's like, well, I've heard this story before. Didn't I hear this story before? Oh yeah, I've heard this story before. And when you know God does it, and he keeps creating these little par parable uh, or, or parallel narratives to the Old Testament, and he brings it in, right? And then John, which is my favorite, 
John just goes like full epic narrative referencing like the entire Old Testament through this, like in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. And like through him, all things are created. Like this beautiful idea, like Genesis one, all the way right from the beginning. So all four of the gospel accounts have deep, deep ties, deep, deep, deep ties uh, uh, to, the, to these different ways. And there's, there's uh, different ways they do it. First is direct quote, direct quote. So we, we mentioned Mark. Here's another example in Matthew 8, 14. It says, when Jesus came into Peter's home, he saw his mother laying sick in bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she got up and waited on him. When the evening came, they brought to him many who were demon possessed and he cast out the spirits uh, with a word and healed all who were ill. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases, which that's Isaiah 53. Now, this happens throughout the Bible. It will directly quote Isaiah or Malachi or something. It will directly quote it. But it's actually less common than what we're going to talk about this, this next thing, which is uh, the, the, the technical term is subtle illusions. Subtle illusions. We mentioned this last week. Like when Jesus got baptized and it says, and then there's a voice from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. This was a subtle allusion to three different stories in the Old Testament, talking about the suffering servant, the seed of Abraham, and from the kingly line. There's this allusion. And you say, why would the Bible that's supposed to help instruct us on how to live, that's our, why would it use subtle allusions? I'll ask you a question. Have you ever been part of an inside joke? I hope to be part of one someday. <laughs> and see, if you got that reference, then you just got a subtle allusion to a show. If you didn't get it, you're out. And you don't know what it means. And you're like, I'm on the outside. Now, the ones who get it, Stacy knows what I'm talking about. The ones who get it are like, I totally get it. I am with you. We are united as one person. This is so great. And the rest of you who don't get it are like looking around thinking, who can I ask to find out so I can be on the end? So what does it mean? You work hard. Now I could tell you what it is from, but then you wouldn't work as hard and it wouldn't mean as much once you find it. So that the next time I mention it, you would know. The Bible is full of these solutions. It expects you to have a deep understanding and knowledge of the Old Testament so that when you read through, because Jesus, listen, Jesus rarely, rarely, rarely said, as it is written, he did it a couple times, but his parables were like full, full, full of subtle allusions to scripture over and over. I mean, there's not a story. There's not words that come out of his mouth so much so that the end of his life, we mentioned at the very end of his life, all he says is scripture. He doesn't quote it. He just says it. It's all these subtle illusions and it makes it more meaningful. But if I say, uh, to quote, you know, Uncle Ben, with great power comes great responsibility. Well, then it's boring. You all know it's from Spider-Man. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I knew that. So there's this subtle illusion. It, it create, there's tons of examples of this. And then the third way is, is a narrative parallels. Um, we mentioned this in, in Luke and his story, but Matthew is actually the whole book of Matthew, because Matthew, we'll talk about this a little later, he's presenting this argument that Jesus is the greater Moses, that Jesus is the greater Moses. So the entire book of Matthew is Jesus replaying this story of Moses. In fact, his teachings are set up in five different teachings, just like the Torah. Jesus started his ministry in the wilderness for 40 days, then came out. Like he was, he was presenting this case. And so he created this parallel, this parallel narrative that Jesus is the greater Moses. This is this idea, like, and it was steeped in it. And he doesn't go and say, I'm writing this account of Jesus to prove to you that he is greater than Moses. That would like, again, they want you to think about it. Now you may say, if I wrote a holy book, I'd make it very clear. And that's why you'll never write a holy book. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> because then people will just like, yeah, whatever. This allows us to immerse ourselves, okay? So it, it has this uh, deep ties to Hebrew scripture, um, th these four accounts. Uh, the second is they make direct or indirect claims on Jesus's identity. Direct 
or indirect claims about Jesus, but he's Jesus, the Messiah, the son of God. But there's not just these big titles, like we see it throughout. So, uh, and all throughout Matthew, like it talks about this in Matthew and the baptism, it says, this is my son. That's what God says. The disciples in Matthew eight say, what kind of man is this? The demons in Matthew later say, what do you want with us, son of God? The people of Nazareth say, isn't this the carpenter's son? The Canaanite woman says, Lord, son of David, heal me. Peter said, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. The high priest said, are you the Messiah, the son of the living God? Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? And the Roman soldier in Matthew 27 says, surely this was the son of God. All four of these accounts will make either direct or indirect claims about the identity, the person of who he is. And just like some of these references, and though there are times where it's very specific, these authors under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit want you to read and to experience him for yourself and to come up with your conclusion in reading about who he is, to make it your own, to make it personal. That's why it says in John chapter 20, verse 30, it says, therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The very end of his gospel account, he gives you the reason of why all these stories are there. Third, this is important. The crucifixion and the resurrection are the climax of the story. If you read the gospels, they all have this arch. It all has this beginning, it has the middle, but it all points to the cross. It all points to the cross. We've mentioned it a couple of times that Mark, the first 10 of the 16 chapters is just like, uh, uh, is, is like the, his whole three years. And then it takes six chapters to go through the last seven days of Jesus. Because the cross, the sacrifice, this is, this is the pinnacle. It's not just the pinnacle of the story of the gospel. They believe it's the pinnacle of the story of all of scripture. That from Genesis to this point, this is the climax of what we get to see of history. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. That is huge. Matthew, he, he mentions it uh, from the very beginning. And he just keeps talking about it over and over again before it leads into it. And then the fourth thing is that even though there's these different, these four different accounts and that some of them have very common stories and some of them have unique stories, that these stories were arranged to emphasize a unique characteristic of Jesus. We mentioned this, that, that Matthew can talk about this greater than Moses figure that he's coming to proclaim the, 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 king of, uh, uh, the kingdom of God's at hand. Mark, he has this emphasis, and we've read through Mark, that there's this mystery and, and like misunderstanding of who Jesus is until the very revelation of the crucifixion, which is why Mark constantly said, and they didn't understand, and they didn't know, and they couldn't understand, and they didn't know. But then you read in other scriptures, they're like, Mark, maybe you didn't understand. I understood who he was. Like, but he was writing this perspective. People misunderstood Jesus until the crucifixion, that he's this idea, right? Luke highlights um, that Jesus came to bring this gospel to the nations and that he's coming to bring the kingdom of God. And John introduces the idea that God became flesh through Jesus. So John keeps writing these, like, these things where he goes through these old covenant stories in which what, what happened is there's this story, and then at some point, God the Father would show up. He parallels those stories, but instead of God the Father showing up, it's Jesus who shows up. So that's why when he quotes Isaiah, and he says that there's a herald bringing in and crying, in, uh, a, a herald in the wilderness, uh, the, the, the voice of God saying, prepare the way for the Lord. And then what happens in the narrative of Isaiah is that Yahweh shows up. In the New Testament, the herald comes, but who shows up? Jesus. Why? Because Jesus and Yahweh are at the same creating a claim. That's a big claim. It's a big claim. Even if you believe it, it's a big claim. This is what's being done. So they have these four different, they, they have those things. And so they're, they're creating this idea for us that each one is unique. And that's why each account is a little different. And that's why each is, 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 is moved around. When I was in college um, and uh, at, at ORU, we always had to take these, these Bible classes. Not always. We took Bible classes. Like you took an Old Testament class, you took a New Testament class. And I'll never forget when they got to the New Testament class, uh, and you've maybe taken some class like this, that it's like survey of New Testament and literature or whatever, right? Um, I was not a very good student. 
Uh, but they get to the section where they talk about how scripture was made and they really love to harp in on apparent contradictions within the gospel accounts. Maybe you've heard this, maybe, maybe you haven't, right? That there's these apparent, and I remember people who grew up in the church, people who had deep relationship with God, they would get so freaked out that they were presented with these apparent uh, contradictions that I knew people who literally, they just abandoned their faith altogether right there in the middle of a class that was supposed to teach you about a deeper revelation of God and his word, they, they would give up. And, and I remember being like, wow, that's interesting. But here's the thing, all four of these perspectives, and when you read some of these stories, you will see that some of them, they're slightly different. And sometimes you read them and they seem very different. But there's a couple things we have to remember when we're looking at that. One, these are eyewitnesses account that have viewed things from two different perspectives. I don't know if you've ever asked someone to tell you what happened that were in the same room. You can get very different experiences from people in the same room who experienced the same thing. Just ask like any investigator. Like that's why I feel bad for the police. They can have 30 eyewitnesses and they can get 30 different stories that are totally different. And you're like, well, how can these, all? And, and by the way, they may all be true. They may all be true to the perspective of who saw it. And so this is one thing. These are, these are eyewitnesses account, but these are also created in a way that they're not just trying to create a, a, a historical narrative. They are trying to create their case. So sometimes things in the orders get moved around because it better fits the prerogative of what they're trying to explain to you through scripture. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. It just means that the, the things were changed. And I actually am more comfortable seeing slight variances in the story from multiple accounts than if everyone said the exact same thing. Have you ever watched one of those stories on like social media that's trying to tell you that we've been taken over by AI and it shows you all the different local newscasters who are saying the exact same story over and over and over again? Has anyone seen that? And you're like, we have been taken over by AI. No, I'm just kidding. We haven't. But there's something uncomfortable when a whole bunch of people say the exact same thing over vast distances in space. Because it's like, how are we all saying the exact same thing? The exact, exact same thing. Like, how did you not even get a little, I'm teaching a sermon to you right now. And if you guys left and I give you 15 minutes and then I brought you back in and said, tell me what I just preached. We would have so many different stories. Half of you won't even be, remember, be able to remember what shirt I'm wearing the moment you step out of this building. The moment you stepped out of this building. And then it's like, oh, we need to get all these in. Like the details, here's something that like, was very fine in the ancient world. We struggle with it modern today because we have like cameras and videos. And all. Like they were not as obsessed with very, very minute details. They cared about the purpose and the heart of the message. They don't need to tell you what Jesus ate on the third Tuesday for brunch. They need to tell you that he's the son of God. That's a big enough claim. You see, and what he ate for brunch is not the thing. So when you go through and you walk through scripture, it's okay to press in and look and to see, well, why did Mark say it this way, but Matthew said it this way? There's probably a reason. Not an incongruency, but a claim that's being made that we get to dive into and say, well, what's the claim? Why was Mark highlighting it this way? And why was Matthew highlighting it this way? Doesn't mean it's inconsistent. In fact, it's the very opposite. It means that it's so robust that one man's life can be perceived infinite amount of ways because he is the God and the creator of the universe. And scripture allows us to bring it back and put it into a context in which we can see the claims of his divinity and what it means to us in our life. So that's how we get to study scripture. Scripture, sometimes if you've studied scripture enough, you get to parts where you don't understand and you'll get to parts that sometimes make you uncomfortable. If I didn't tell you that, then I wouldn't be loving you. Like everyone loves a good John 3, 16. Like that's great. And I love John 3, 16. But then every once in a while we get through a section of scripture that makes us uncomfortable. That I don't like. That I don't understand. That I'm just like, what is going on? I don't get it. God, this seems opposite to what you said over here but you are not a man that you should change your mind. So then I need to dive into this and I need to help me, Lord, understand. Have your spirit illuminate what this means to me. And that's why Jesus says, yeah, I'm revealed through all of scripture. This news is good. What I'm teaching is good, but I'm sending you a helper who will reveal all things to you as truth. Invite the helper. Invite the helper. 
I'm going to give you a few things in ways, specific ideas and ways that we can read through scripture and read through the gospel accounts a little differently. But the number one thing I'll tell you before I even get to some of these practical things is invite the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit knows. I don't know. The commentaries sometimes are guessing. The internet is full of really interesting theories, most of which are wrong. But the Holy Spirit, the third person of the, that he is there to illuminate the word of God and bring it to life in your life, to bring that truth, to understand. And so when you come across something that seems hard or seems harsh or seems out of character, or seems like it doesn't make sense, don't say, oh, you can pretend that doesn't exist. Just gonna, oh, that probably shouldn't have been in there. Oh, that doesn't apply to me. No, we get to take some time and say, God, can you help me understand that passage? And guys, I'll be honest with you. There's a section of scripture that I didn't understand. I invited the Holy Spirit into it. He gave a revelation. And I'm like, wow, God, that's so good. It means so much to me now. And then there's other passages of scripture that I don't understand. I've asked the Holy Spirit to give me a revelation and I'm still waiting. Still waiting. Still don't know what revelation is about. Sorry. No idea. I mean, I know generally what's time, but you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. A lot of the prophets, yeah, still waiting. Why is James such a weird book in the New Testament? I don't know, still waiting. Like there's stuff, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. And it's like, God, reveal it to me. But it doesn't mean I don't go to it. I go to it. I'm like, maybe God will reveal it to me this time. And then I read it, I'm like, nope, still don't. Still need the spirit to move. And that's okay. That's okay. Because I'm in a lifelong pursuit of understanding the heart of God. Not a one-time thing. I don't hold God hostage. God, either you make this un completely understandable to me now or I'm done. I've done that before. And what you're saying to God is, hey, God, creator of the heaven and the universe, I don't even understand how gravity works, which is a very measurable thing. I don't even get it. But can you just really understand me deeper truths of spiritual purpose and being the first time? Yeah, I know I don't understand physics or gravity or elements, or why some things burn, and why they, I don't understand any of that, God, but can you just make this really clear to me the first time without any study or, or, or the process of pursuing to you things? Because I don't understand, God. Not understanding is okay. It's okay. In fact, that should be the thing that drives us to a deeper desire to grow. I don't totally understand this, God, but what I do know is that you love me, that you care about me, that you want me to be like you, and your spirit will teach me everything I need to know. So either this is something I don't need to know right now or something you reveal later, and I'm good with it because it's not my will, but your will be done. So I can chase that and pursue that. So here's a couple of things, a couple of uh, practical things. One, when we're reading the Bible, this is the same in the Old Testament, discover any of the like, significant repeated words or ideas or, or phrases, Right? And I'll, I'll add a side thing to this. Some of you guys read the Bible on your phone, which is great. Some of you guys have a, a, a paperback, which is great. Uh, some of you listen to an audio, which is, it can be fine. I listen to audio sometimes too. But I would encourage you to find, a, whether it's an app or a hard copy, that whenever possible, or as many, and it won't get them all, that it has those little footnotes. You know what I'm talking about? The old school footnotes. And it's like, ooh, that was from 1 Kings. Oh, that was from 2 Chronicles. Oh, and then some passages, if you read like John, it's just like loaded. Like it just can't keep up with all the different footnotes and references. Have something that has the Old Testament reference built in, like this almost it, it built in concordance, whether it's the footer or the, or the middle, that helps you look back and be like, well, what was that story about? It's telling me I should have this story in mind. Why? Why should I have that story in mind? Let me reread that story and then read this story again in light of what that story said. Because that's how the Bible works. These hyperlinks are connected and I may not connect them on my own, but I can get a little reference help and be like, oh, he was referencing this scripture, this part of this prophet. Okay, well, let me read this. And I get to see how these things are connected because they were deeply connected and the people who were living in that day's mind. And so we get to see what those look like. So we look for those repeated ideas and the connected stories. And then the second thing is, Instead of, I think a lot of times we walk away with this idea of like, I'm going to read a section of scripture. How should this change the way that, that I live? And, this, and that's not necessarily a bad question. Sometimes we do read a scripture and we should like realize that there's certain things I do and, and that need change in my life. But, but a lot of times, especially in the gospel accounts, I could ask myself a little better question, which is, what are they wanting me to know about Jesus through this story? Who is Jesus in this story? Because remember, if I discover who Jesus is in this story, then I discover who I am in my story. 
Because as he is, so am I in this world. These things and greater I will accomplish through the person of Jesus as I'm being conformed and transformed daily into the very image of Jesus Christ as he's tabernacled in my heart. And so if I better understand who he is in that story, I better understand who I am in my story. And it's just a slight different change of looking at. Um, here's another one. When we read through these, these, these accounts, pay attention to how the, the other characters respond to Jesus. How do they respond? When Jesus does a miracle or he preaches a message or, or he has an interaction, how do people respond? What were their motivation? What was the result? Do I see myself responding in a similar way? Would I respond that way? You know, one that always really gets me is when that man came and said, hey, my son is sick. If you're willing, able, will you heal my son? And Jesus says, what do you mean if I'm able? Anything's possible for those who believe. And the man says, I believe. Will you help me with my unbelief? I fully resonate with that character. That dichotomy of full belief and trust in Jesus while simultaneously having disbelief and untrust in my heart, I resonate with that person. And you know what I see the result? That boy, that man's son was healed. That's the result. So guess what? I say, God, help me with my unbelief. I see myself in that story. Maybe you see yourself in these other stories. Sometimes I see the reaction. I think, why do they react that way? And other times I'm like, I would react that way or worse. That's okay. That's what we get to see. What, what was the result? Remember, there's not a lot of, um, in this writing style, there's not a lot of, and Peter cut off that guy's ear, and Peter was bad. It doesn't tell you that. It just lets you see by the context of the story, Peter lost his temper again, and Peter cut off this guy's ear. Whoops. Jesus said it was bad because he put the ear back on and healed it. Right, it allows you to see it through the narrative. So that's to say, pay attention. How do people read? And here's the third thing, and this is a challenge that I'm I'm, I'm uh, giving to myself as well, and, and wanting to pick up. Read and read and read and read those gospel accounts over and over, more than once, more than twice. You know, they were originally intended. This is hard. I'm not, I'm not even throwing this down as like a challenge, but they were originally intended uh, to be consumed, or to be read, and to be heard so much that they became memorized. And I don't know about you, but I do not have the gospel accounts memorized. I don't. And I think, sometimes I think, why not? I've got a lot of Hamilton memorized. <laughs> which I'm not saying is bad, but it doesn't really help me other than the random uh, historical date that sometimes comes out of knowing Hamilton, which has helped my kids in more than one test, by the way. But, but if I memorize all these other things in my life, I've got a lot of coffee ratios floating around in my mind. M maybe this encounter of the, in the story of the person that I treasure and value the most, maybe I should give a little more emphasis to, to what that looks like. And reading that and memorizing that, hiding that word in my heart, allowing that word to be a lamp into my feet and a light into my path, treasuring it where it's at. And I can tell you, you read it and you read it and you read it. And here's the thing that happens when you read it and you keep your mind open. Not, oh, I know what happened next. I know what happened next. I know what... Scripture, just like the Old Testament, just like the, it begins to continue to open up. And what happens as opposed to saying, oh, I've already read this once. The second time will be faster. And the third time will be faster still. What ends up happening is every time you continually read through scripture with this open mind and allowing the spirit to lead and allowing scripture to define itself, you find out that you end up going slower and slower and slower because you start to see more and more connections that are outside of the direct narrative. And you keep finding, and then you're like, I made it one verse. I made it through Matthew chapter one, verse one. And then I went off on a rabbit trail and I've been in the Old Testament prophets ever since. And guess what? That's okay. We are not reading through the gospel for a check mark and a gold sticker. It's neat when you version gives you like a great job. You completed your reading plan today. 
Like, it's neat. It's like a motivator. It's like a little carrot. It's okay. But it doesn't actually mean that scripture is becoming alive to you and transforming your life. And so if you only get one verse of what you were supposed to read that day, and then you end up somewhere completely different, but he completely reveals to you something that's going on in your heart or in your mind or in your loved one, or he transforms your idea around something, then what is more important? If he shows you something that's good, or he tells you maybe very clearly, this is bad. How valuable is that? How valuable is that? And when we realize that these gospels are just continuing to create this account and showing us the climax of who Jesus is, we haven't even gotten into the good. I mean, the gospel are full of the greatest character of all time, Jesus Christ, the greatest teaching of all time, Jesus Christ, the greatest story of love of all time, Jesus Christ. We haven't even got to talk about that. Do you know why? Because it's so big. It's so big. And I want you to begin to explore the word, to dive into the word, to allow your imagination to go free when in the word. It's okay to be thinking like, God, what does that mean? Where can I go? Be, be creative. You serve the creator of the universe. God is a God of order and divine perfection. He is also creative. And sometimes your creative juices begin to flow when you allow your mind to relax and to be at play and say, God, what does this mean? How does this go? And let it float around in there. That's why daily scripture is important. That's why I think sometimes reading scripture in the morning is important because you read something in the morning and you allow that to float around throughout the day. God, I'm going to think about that. I'm going to meditate about that. What does that mean? How does this mean in my life? And at some point, maybe three o'clock in the afternoon over a cup of coffee, you may be hit with an inspiration and you find it. That's why studying for these series have been so hard because I love it so much. I keep saying, okay, Jonathan, you really got to get those notes done. And then I will be off in the weeds for hours, not studying at all what I should be studying for this Sunday. It's really good. You'll probably never hear anything about it. But I'm constantly having to be like, God, shouldn't I be back to the other stuff? He's like, are you in a hurry? No, Lord, I'm sorry just going to stay in it. Because when the Holy Spirit comes and inspires, he inspires. You don't have to know all the Greek and the Hebrew. You don't have to know all the different terms. You don't need to know the for this or how this or the counsel of this. Or like You don't need to know any of that. But when you spend time in the presence of God and you allow the word to be illuminated, the spirit will quicken you, quicken you, quicken you and say, hey, do you remember that story? Listen, Jesus just said that. Do you remember that story? I'll give you the sign of this, the sign of, of Jonah. Remember Lot's wife. Wait, what? Remember Lot's wife? What does that mean, Jesus? Why did you say that? Let me go read that story of Lot's wife again. What was going on there? She looked back. Remember not the former things, but remember the future things. What are you saying to me, Jesus? How can I know? Remember Lot's wife. That's the second shortest verse in Scripture. What does it mean? The spirit leads, the spirit leads, the spirit leads, and we get to walk into that. That's why the Bible says that the word is alive and well and sharper than any two-edged sword. So next week, we're gonna get, get into it, and we're just barely, we're gonna look at some of the parables of Jesus. Not all of them, some of them. And we're gonna see a master teacher you may think Jesus is good, but when you realize the depth and the breadth and the intricacies and the specific way in which he, he was the greatest teacher of all time. Of all time. And we're gonna read through some of the parables, which is the number one way that he taught. and hopefully see some illumination and hopefully see things that he's referencing, the things that should be being sparked in our minds and what we should see. Because some of them at first glance, you're like, I get it. And that some of them at first, you're like, I have no idea what Jesus is talking about. Am I the pearl? Is there a pearl? Should I buy a pearl? Isn't it deceptive to buy something that someone else didn't know about? That seems a little trickery. 
the word is good. I just want to close with this. I want to close with this because it's important. Some of you, I know because we talk about it all the time. I know there's a, there's, there's a, there's a group in, of you in here. You read the Bible regularly. You love the word. You keep going on. You do it. But I know also that there is a group of people that you are either intimidated by the word or it's not part of your routine. And sometimes when I talk about reading daily scripture or, or engaging the word, the only thing that happens is you feel like you fall short and you feel guilty that you don't do enough. I want to tell you, first of all, the Bible tells me that for those in Christ, there's no longer any guilt or condemnation. You don't have to earn your salvation through the word. No, but you better understand your identity from the word. And that's why we get to pursue it, number one. N number two, there's no minimum maximum. There's no minimum maximum. There's no, there's no this like, oh my gosh, if I don't read a whole chapter or if I don't spend 30 minutes or if it's not the first thing I do in the morning or if it's not like that's, that's not the case. There is grace for wherever you're at today. And the word will encounter you wherever you're at. And so listen, if you have five minutes, and I, I say this with all love, you have five minutes for sure. For sure. Take five minutes. Take five minutes. Encounter scripture. And see what happens. See what happens. And if, if you're like, oh, well, I read it. Nothing happened. That's okay. Keep reading the next day, five minutes. Keep reading the next day, five minutes. You know, if you had a piece of ice and the room was 25 degrees and you kept warming it up, at 26 degrees, nothing happened. At 27 degrees, nothing happened. At 28 degrees, nothing happened. 29 degrees, nothing happened. At 30 degrees, nothing happened. At 31 degrees, nothing happened. And if you stop there, you say, see, nothing happened. Yet things were happening. Scientifically, things are happening, but the evidence of something happening wasn't be able to be seen because the ice was still frozen. But all of a sudden at 32 and at 33 degrees, you start to see the evidence of the result. Just because you went to scripture once and you said, well, nothing happened. No, something happened. Something happened. You may didn't see it. Maybe you didn't feel it. It happens. That's the power of scripture. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for this word. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit is illuminating things. Lord, I don't feel like I'm capable of describing your text well enough and with the awe and the respect and the grandeur that it deserves. But Lord, I know as complex and as beautiful and as intricate as your word is, I also know that it's simple enough that a child can come to you and to receive it. And Father God, wherever we find ourselves engaging in your word, and in our process of growing and maturing into your image. I pray that you would just continue to lead us and guide us, that your spirit continue to work in our lives today. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for the opportunity we have to worship together. It's in Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen and amen. Well, church, I love you very much. I can't wait to talk about the parables. They're gonna be fun. It's gonna be exciting to read through some of those. You are dismissed. Have a great rest of your Sunday.